Good afternoon and welcome to our lecture series. Today, we have the privilege of hosting a speaker who brings a wealth of knowledge and expertise in the fields of uh, computational linguistics and language technology. Our speaker, Dr. Tracy Holloway King, is currently a senior principal scientist focusing on uh, search science within Adobe's search and discovery team. At Adobe, uh, her work focuses on enhancing multimodal and text search and recommendation relevance, including evaluation and AI ethics for search models and features. Uh, Tracy earned her PhD from Stanford University, after which she spent over a decade as an NLP researcher uh, at Park. And I remember that period with warm feelings, uh, during which we worked together somehow on the different grammar development projects. She then transitioned into applied science roles at several major companies, Microsoft Big, uh, Bing, uh, eBay Search Science, and Amazon Query Understanding before joining Adobe. Uh, her experience and expertise have also led her to regularly uh, review for leading NLP conferences, as well as co-organize uh, workshops at prominent conferences uh, such as ACL, Colling, and SIGGIR. And notably, recently she co-organized the industry track series at SIGGIR uh, uh, 2023. Uh, Tracy, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and please, everyone, feel free. If you something's unclear, you're welcome. That we'll have plenty of time for questions, and you're welcome to ask questions within the talk. Um, I'm going to be talking about multimodal search and some new technologies used in search, including embeddings. Don't worry if you don't know what multimodal means. Your only familiarity with search is things you've searched for, and you have no idea what an embedding means, because we're going to cover that in this. Okay. Hang on, I've got to get my... There we go. Um, so one of the questions... I get a lot, especially from more junior members of my team is, do we need search anymore? You know, if they're on the team, maybe they're asking, should, should I even be looking for a different field? And as you'll see in this, the answer I feel to this is definitely not. Search is actually really important and it's an exciting time. It's just going to look different. Now, why might you be worrying about, do we need search anymore? Um, if you go to Google or any other search engine and you type in a query, you might notice you can now type in longer queries, like insert carriage return in Excel. I do. I have to do this, Excel is a spreadsheet, like twice a year. I can never remember how to do it. So I always have to search for it. And if I do this now, I get this nice little summary at the top. They've even highlighted the part that I need. And since I've done this before, I actually know this is accurate. So I don't even have to go and look further down and check. And it's like, well, if you can do this, you know, magic, magic answering for that. Um, interestingly, there have also been things that are sort of answer like even before people were doing having what you might think of as those generative answers, answers that were created on the fly. So, you know, if you look for a city name, you get beautiful pictures, you get maps, um, you get things like at the top there where all is the default, but they know you might want images and maps and news uh, before some of the other things that you might uh, have about city names. So search engines were already getting really smart trying to optimize for what you wanted but the difference now is that these you don't they don't have to just memorize these. You can have things like that inserting the carriage return created for you on the fly, nicely summarized, little highlights. It's great. Um, so why do we need search? Well, for one thing, there are lots of things you really want for yourself. This is my cat, Dasha. She was, as you can see, helping me do a puzzle. And I wanted to try to find the photo. This is Google Images. I never tag my images. I do not relabel them. I'm sure most of you, except for maybe a few of you who are serious photographers, do not do this. I typed in cat puzzle 
And I only have two photos like this and bam, there they were. But I did not want an AI generated cat with a puzzle. I didn't want a random thing. This was on my photos. That type of search is always going to be there. You know, you want to send pictures of your kids to your parents. You need those to be pictures of your kids. Okay. So search really isn't dead. So it's, but it's key to a lot of projects and sometimes it's direct. I need my, my picture of Dasha there, sitting there waiting to steal a puzzle piece. But a lot of the times now it's moved more under the hood. So that Excel answer actually has to find documents about Excel to make sure it's up to date. Because if Microsoft changes, you know, how you put in a carriage return in an Excel sheet, they need to be up to date. They don't need the one for the previous version. So you still have to be able to search and find that. Um, and sometimes maybe you want to find out a lot more. You know, sure, you learned how to put the carriage return in. That's really easy. But sometimes you need to do something more complicated. You want to follow the links to the original doc help documents or someone's nice tutorial video. And all of that is still done with search. Um, and embeddings, which I will explain uh, a little later, really can help us take search to this next level, find images without my having labeled them myself, create answers on the fly, things like that, which is, I like to think of it as if you went into a store and you have a really good uh, shop assistant, they can even tell when you walk in how experienced you are and what kind of help you're going to need. They know when you want to browse. They know when you, you know, when to help you decide something. And what what search is evolving into is becoming more and more these truly expert assistants for us. Okay, so basically, I'm going to give the talk here, and if you have questions, for, especially for clarification, feel free to ask during that, and we'll have plenty of time for discussion and questions. Um, because people don't do image search as much and it's re and it really highlights where the technologies are taking us, I'm first going to go through some examples of the type of image search I've been working on at Adobe. Um, then I'm going to uh, talk about how search works because I think search like natural language processing is something we do a lot as just sort of private individuals. We're very good at, but understanding how it really works and what makes it hard uh, for the machines is, is something that you may not be aware of. Um, I'm going to talk about is some issues with both what I'll call traditional or classic search techniques and the newer ones, the embeddings in the title. Um, talk a little bit about, you know, solutions where I think the field's going to be going with this and then some uh, key takeaways uh, that hopefully will be a good launch pad for some discussion. Okay, so one of the main things I work on is this thing called Adobe Stock. So if you, for example, have a business and you need a really high quality image to put on your website, um, that's not something personal, you just need an image. Uh, Adobe Stock sells what's called stock photography and stock videos and stock music. Um, it's a, that you can go and you can license it and then you can use it, it, you know, social media campaigns, website, you get people buy images to put on, on the sides of buses for ads, that kind of thing. Um, and most of the time they're just issuing short keyword searches. Kids with sunglasses, maybe I need to do a summer beach, you know, thing. That's all I say. And we have to find a whole bunch of images. And we don't know, you know, all you said was kids with sunglasses. We don't know what you're going to use it for. We don't know if you want a solid background, a natural looking background. So we want to put a fairly diverse set of results up. And by the way, we're doing, I'm not going to talk about it in detail here, but we have to do this in a whole bunch of different languages. We need the results to be culturally appropriate. So for example, if we're in Japan, we want more Japanese people in the pictures of the kids with the sunglasses, things like that. I'm not going to focus on that here, um, but we will talk a little bit about how do you go from these few short words, and they are words, into finding a set of images to show. 
Okay. Um, because this is images and we often have very professional designers who are wanting to create things, we have a whole bunch of things that are a little more complicated than just asking, putting in your keyword. Um, and in particular, you can do things, and this is where the multimodal, so modalities are things like text, images, colors. You can do something like find one photo, like this one of the table view on the left. Maybe you really like the colors in that. Um, but you, what you want is a set of an image of flowers that have those colors. Um, it's really hard to describe colors. I have no idea. What, what's that? Rusty orange and dusky teal blue, whatever those colors are on the left. But we have a thing, and this is in production. You could go to Adobe Stock and play with it after this if you want. You can select just to look for the colors, then type in your keyword flowers and get a bunch of images that have roughly that color palette and have flowers in them. And so this lets somebody, if they need a whole series of pictures that have the same color palette, but with different themes, go through and find them. It's actually probably my favorite feature on Adobe Stock. It's, real, it's really cool um, to work with. Um, and so one question would be like, how do you even do this? How do you get the same, know what these color palettes are? Because we'll see how a little how it's done. And it's not done with creating words about these colors because they're really, except for maybe color specialists, there are no words to describe these. Okay, so how does classic search work? It works with this thing called an inverted index. So a search index is really like the index at the back of a book. That's why it's called an index, very handy. So, you know, on the right here, you can see, uh, this is just an index from some linguistic book, which I was probably editing, which is probably why I had the PDF of it. And it just says, if you need to find the pages that have verb net, they're on pages 251, et cetera. Um, this is effectively what these massive search index, uh, search engines you used, Google, Bing, anything else, private search you're doing on documents, how they work. Basically for every document, so in our book example, every page of the book, you're going to find every word that's associated with it. Um, then you're just going to build up this index with the words and each and the ident the identifier of each document that contains them. So for VerbNet, it's page two fifty one. All the other pages that mentioned that. Um, so now you have your search index. That's all it is. Um, obviously, there are a lot of things to make this work really well and scale and be fast, but that's basically all there is. Um, and so when I come in and I'm, you know, looking for my, how to do my Excel carriage return, what happens? Basically, you break the query into individual words. You find all the documents associated with each word. And then you return the documents that match, ideally, all the words in the query. Because that's, and it, 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 hopefully that captures everything you want. That might be a lot of documents. So you need to have a way to rank them to you. So think of it as you've got, you're making a list. You need to know what's going to be on top of the list. So we'll go through the what's probably the smallest search example anyone's ever done. So we have here four documents. Cats are furry, mice are furry, dogs chase cats, and cats chase mice. So each of these little sentences is going to be a document. So I'm going to break those up into words and record what the document number is that has it. So cat shows up in the first, uh, third, and fourth document. Dogs only show up once. I, as you could tell from the picture of Dasha, I'm a cat person, so the cats get more billing here. Um, you'll notice that, for example, R does not show up. It's so frequent. That it uh, that indexing it is often not worthwhile because so many documents would come back. Uh, these are call, often called stop words, which just means you don't bother to index them. So we have our teeny tiny little search index here. And so what happens? 
you know, when a query come in, comes in. If our query is cats, we just need to find all the document that has cat in it. And for those of you who do uh, natural language processing, you will note that I took the, I found the limb up, or I took the plural cats into the singular cat, just so that you could find things a little more easily. But single word query, really easy. You just go up to the index, you see the word cat, and you read off the number of documents there. You might want to decide how you're going to order them. Maybe, in fact, you want first documents one and four because the cat is a very prominent, it's the subject, it's the first word, and maybe document three should be later. But that one's very simple to do. When you do cats and dog, similar type of thing. First, you get all the things with cat, all the things with dog. You find that which of those show up in both. So that's document three, and that's the document you return. Um, so this is basically what's happening on a search engine. And so the trick is just to very, very quickly find the words that you need and figure out then what order to go there. Um, but importantly, you have to have something you're going to index that is the same as the type of thing people are going to be asking about. Um, so, you know, if I can't indirectly be indexing these images because those don't uh, correspond to words, I'm actually corresponding, uh, indexing the words there. Okay. So how, how do you do search over images? Well, sort of traditionally what you do is you find ways to describe the images in words, and then you just search as if the images were in fact words. Uh, so for Adobe Stock, we fortunate, we're very lucky. These are, it's a marketplace, professional photographers. If you're a professional photographer, you could sell your images there. They provide us with a lot of data. In addition to you know high resolution images, they give us a caption. They give us tags, so just key, little words that are, are not ordered, but they all describe this. Um, there's good metadata, like um, probably not for this bat photo, but if you have a photo of a place, it'll say where it's from. If there are people in it, they're the release forms about the people. Um, the date of when it was created, so we know how recent it is. Um, we know the file type. So we might know if it's a vector graphic or if it's actually just a photo. We also run a whole bunch of machine learned analyzers over these. So we can, in addition to the tags the photographer provided, we get tags that an auto tagger provided. So there might be ones they missed, but that are very useful. Um, color one tags are sort of like this. Often you don't think to mention that there's a black background, for example. Um, and you can do the same with captions. Um, let me see. So here, you know, this particular photo, you know, there was a caption. I think it's hand-drawn illustration of a bat. I've got your names over the side, so I can't see absolutely everything. You know, you get tags like vector, bat. You get a tag that says vampire, and you can start seeing some of the issues with searching because this is a vampire bat. If you were looking for a photo of a vampire, this is probably not what you wanted. Um, and also we know things like it's a vector graphic. We have the seller ID in case somebody's looking for items from a particular seller, for example. Um, so with all this textual information, we can create a text image like we saw for our little tiny example with the furry mice um, and just search as text. But you lose a lot of information because um, there's a reason there's an expression in English, an image is worth a thousand words. I think it's more than a thousand. Describing images and what you want in, in queries is really hard. Okay. And so this is part of the motivation for leveraging ways of going beyond just the text or getting more power out of your text. And what we're going to talk about here are these things called embeddings. So needless to say, we will first talk about what an embedding is. So what we're going to do is turn our content into an embedding or what's basically a vector. And effectively, it's just a, a long series of numbers. 
So as you can imagine, it's really hard to interpret these because these are just series of numbers. But the idea of these series is to have similar content, have similar embeddings. Um, so I like to think of this as just this abstract space that's sort of like a 3D map. Um, if you think of those, I don't know if you ever saw them, but they would, when I was like studying French, we'd have a map of France and it would have the city names, but it would also have a cute picture of like the cheese from that region or the or wine or whatever the region was known for. I like to think of for search, these embedding spaces for images are like that. You've got this map of the region and there's the hill where the bats are. There's the hill where the pumpkins are. And somehow or other, hopefully, if you have something like this slightly bizarre, but this is a real stock image, pumpkin made to look like a bat, obviously it's a Halloween image, that's somewhere that's in between the two. Maybe it's in the little valley between them. Um, and what we're also going to see is, although here I'm talking just about where the images are, you could think of that there's also text here, which is sort of like the city names in your map of France uh, type of example. Um, so all we're doing is moving, is treating all these images as this really abstract space where we can pack a lot of information and, and work over it. So we'll sort of talk about uh, this a bit. So your search space really isn't an inverted index anymore. It's just this mathematical space, this, this map of France with all the hills. When a query comes in, we have to map it into a vector or an embedding, and it has to be in the same space. Um, if it was an embedding that mapped to the night sky, that's not very useful for searching over our map of France. Um, when you do work in this space, relevance or what you want to retrieve is just measured by how close the vectors are. You know, you can imagine you've got, you know, one thing in numbers here, one here, you just need to move them as close as possible. Whatever's really close is considered to be a really good match. So, you know, that line drawing of what is basically cl clearly the same bat as the bat with the color is should be a very, very close match. They won't be identical, uh, but they should be very close. Yes, so essentially, Tracy, this relevance is uh, is somehow identified with semantic similarity in in terms of language uh, uh, and and linguistic processing, I would say, right? Just That's to... right. And this is often, this is actually a very good call out. Searching with embeddings is often just, or uh, of some type is often referred to as semantic search. Um, and it, it really is using this and you can do it and we'll have one example way at the end. You can actually do this with just text to text instead of searching mm -hmm. for the keywords. You can turn your words into a mathematical space and you can search over them that way. Yeah, so the idea is you're you're abstracting a little bit away from these very symbolic words. Okay. So we saw with our you know fuzzy mice example what it's like to just do text to a text to text search. Um you can do what I'm calling here pure embedding based search. We're just talking about the embeddings over a single modality. So you can do image to image search or audio, like music to music search or text to text search. This is the easiest thing to sort of think about um, and do. It's conceptually very similar, uh, very simple to, to, to think about. None of this is simple to actually do well. Um, you're got, you've got some type of embeddings for each, to, each asset, each image you're, you're going to get the embedding and index it. You're going to, when your query comes in, and in this case, your query is an image. So it's that boat image on the left there. You're going to calculate the same type of embedding for it. You're going to compare these to the assets in the index, and you're just going to rank them by distance. And so what usually happens is the exact match uh, image is the very first one, because that's a perfect match. 
And then just you move slowly away from that on things. And it's in this case, it's what I, it's a, just overall similarity. So they've got similar color, similar items in it. Overall, they just look very, very similar. Um, the benefits of this, as Alex just mentioned, you capture semantic similarity doing this. Um, it makes it really easy to find very similar assets. So say I like that boat photo, but I'm not quite sure it's perfect for what I want. Maybe I can see things that are close and there might be one that's just a little bit different, a little brighter, the boat's a little closer, things like that. Um, and there, at least when you're working in text and images, there are a lot of existing embedding models you can use for this. So you probably won't have to train something completely from scratch yourself. Um, do we have a question, Alex? I see. Yeah, it's just my- I'm afraid to click into the chat and lose. No worries, I, I'll be reading any comment or question. So she, she said, Mara said that she was about to ask what kind of properties are used to create a vector and whether these are customizable. Um, yes, so I mean, usually each type of, uh, each modality here has its own types of embeddings for it. So like, you know, if you have a type of thing that creates embeddings from images, usually, although we will see um, some exceptions, you need something different for text. Um, there, Depending on what you need to do, you can either take an existing embedding model and fine tune it. So you can just change part, take the, the big part of it, but fix it. I think of this, it's easier to think of for um, text. You could take a big text model and have it be very specialized for what you're working on because your vocabulary may be a lot smaller. So for example, if we need something on help vocabulary for all the help documents at Adobe, that doesn't cover all the language in the world. It just covers a small amount of it. And so you, you can take advantage of doing that. Um, that is one of the biggest things that if you're building an application, you do have to work on is decide, is an existing model good enough for what you want? Or do you wanna fine tune it? Or do you want to just completely train something from scratch? Um, and I, I always feel it's very good to baseline off of some existing model and just get a feel, okay, we just use it out of the box, what works and what doesn't work. So basically it's 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 a matter of trying of trial and error, right? Uh, of seeing. Yeah, yeah. So so it, you need for when you want to really use these for something, you you need to try some things. And generally I find it's best try something that's easy to try because it already exists. Hmm. Then go and uh, train your own if you need to. Hmm. And something else that came just now to my mind. So if you have these different types of embeddings, then I guess that you have to somehow project these different types of embeddings so that you have a unified, unified uh, uh, exactly. Yes, we will be getting into that. Might uh, even be the next slide. Um, oh, good, good. And that 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 is definitely one. Uh, I, if it's not the next one, it will come. Uh, oh. But yes, you you that is exactly an issue. This is sort of the single modality. It's just image to image. That makes it for exactly the reasons you mentioned, mm -hmm. very easy to do. Ah, we have one slide before we get yeah. that. Um, you know. Sometimes you do want something very specialized. So people really care about colors when they're doing these marketing campaigns, you know, creating things for their web page. So it was worthwhile creating special embeddings just for color. For a lot of image search use cases, this may not have been the case. So this is, but for us, because people really do care about the colors, one, they have you know, maybe it's on their brand or they've already got the perfect Im image for one thing and they need a whole series. We created embeddings that all they capture is the color. So if you start with these bowls here, if you don't have a keyword to constrain, you just get everything that's as most similar in color as possible. And you can see we get a whole bunch of different things that have nothing to do with one another, but they are all basically the same color palette. Um, and you'll note also that although those, 
I guess they're glass balls, might actually be photos. Many of these are illustrations. So it's really interesting to see what comes out. To create a specialized embedding of this type to go to the, the question we had, you have to be sure that it's really a worth, you know, something that is worthwhile to do for your use case. And you would have different types of balls, right? It's just the, the ambiguity stroke back. <laughs> you have the balls and the, the yeah. yeah. It's just very interesting. Yeah, yeah, no, it, it 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 search is a really interesting space. You could you see a lot about what things pe are similar, what the machines see as similar and, and don't see as similar, even in keyword search, much less. Um, like that bat example we have. Okay. If you just issue bat, you'll see the little animals, but you'll also see the baseball bats and the cricket bats. And if a person sees that, then, then they can very quickly either use image similarity search or refine their keyword to say like baseball bat uh, to say which one they want. But when you're thinking of it as a person searching, you have something in mind. So it doesn't even occur to you. You need to do this um, as part of what I think makes search really interesting to work on. Discourse and context, right? Yeah. 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 And the more you've got the context, the more likely you can sort of, as the machine, get it right in the first place. But yeah. if a brand new person comes in and types in bat, yeah. you really don't know, but you want to actually show some of both so that they're able to quickly decide which one they want. Assuming, obviously, if you're a sports equipment uh, company, you only have one type of bat. So your, your life is easy. Yeah. But when you're selling images, that's a different matter. Okay, so as Alex brought up, things get a little more complicated when you have multiple modalities. And in search, this usually means text from a query to something else. So text to images and image embeddings, text to video embeddings, text to audio embeddings. Um, there's a quite famous um, text to image model called CLIP, which I just put in here so that if you're ever reading something and see the word CLIP, you'll know, oh, text to image model. Um, these are usually done with exactly what Alex described. You have a text model and something like an image model, and you have a whole bunch of training data. So images with text on them, it, however you got that text, and you just need to push them into the same space so that when you're searching with words, you can actually find your images. Um, it is possible to do other types of modalities. So one that I think would be particularly useful to have in sort of the creation business, which is largely what Adobe is in, is to help people create digital media is a video to music one. So if you had a little video clip, could you more easily find music that went well with it? That would be a really cool thing to have. Um, these multimodal embeddings are really, really useful for search. Um, because if you think about this, if you're going from text to image, you're very robust to sort of what are called vocabulary mismatches. Um, so this is a, a very long query, meditating on a deck overlooking a city at golden hour. I can tell you golden hours become very, very popular thing to ser search for, but people just have dusk or dawn, you know, type of thing on their images. It's not mentioned very much. If you didn't have embedding based search, you'd probably get one, maybe two images for this. But with the embeddings, you're able to match things straight into the image space. So it doesn't matter if somebody called this, you know, sitting on a deck, you know, overlooking a town at, at sunset or something like that. You would still be able to match it. Um, the other thing about these, and this is both good and bad, is you always find something. If you're what you're looking for is sort of distance between your query embedding and all your image embeddings, you'll get the closest one, but it might be really, really far away. Um, and so in this case, it's really good because there are in fact images that are pretty close to this. 
But if you didn't have any images of this type, I don't, you know, who knows what exactly it would key on to and what, what you would get back. Uh, you might just get cityscapes. You might get dawn scenes of uh, mountains. You know, it, so it and it can be very hard to figure out where do you cut off and say, sorry, I just don't have anything. Um, and that can be very frustrating for someone who's querying because you don't know if the system's just wrong or if there's not something in there that matches what you want. Uh, so it's both a strength and a weakness of these. Uh, but when people are people are starting to type longer queries because you can do this and once one system can do it, everybody expects it. Um, but we still see the short ones too. So it's, it's, it's an interesting problem. Okay. Um, so I'm now going to talk about some challenges of using these embeddings generally as opposed to the keywords, but sometimes it's uh, also, some of these I'll highlight are also problems with the keywords. Um, so for most embedding based search, it's really, really hard to declare a good, bad cutoff. So when you were doing keywords, you could decide, okay, if you don't match all the keywords, we're going to declare you to be bad, that's it, you know? Um, it still might not necessarily be good, but at least you might know it was likely to be bad. Um, there really isn't any concept of irrelevance in these embeddings. I mean, you're just sort of further away. So, um, that, that I, this was sort of for an internal system we were playing with. And I, I knew we basically had almost nothing for a purple frog dancing at a disco. <laughs> this is not the type of thing you expect to have a lot of photos for. Um, so I purposely did that for this talk. And, you know, I will say that second one is a lot closer than I would have thought we had anything, but we get purple disco balls. We get... A lot of frogs that do look like they might be dancing at a disco, but there's not really a purple frog dancing at a disco. And there's no way to, the system just doesn't know this. This was the closest it could come, um, which was pretty close, I will say, mm -hmm. but we probably just really don't have anything that exactly matches this. Um, it's, 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 so, so, it's so close to... to to the illusion that there is a reference here, that they refer to something, or, I mean, but still, I mean, you see the, the weaknesses. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and because, for example, if you're searching on Adobe Stock, there are hundreds of millions of images in there. Chances are, if it's something that you could actually photograph, mm -hmm. there probably is something in there. But when you get to this sort of surreal space, Mm -hmm. um there's still as you can see a lot um mm -hmm. but there's not everything you can imagine like if you want a purple frog dancing at a disco this might be a space to actually just use image generation um and i think that's going to be in a separate uh, maybe a maybe a separate future thing to talk about is how do you decide between when you should be searching when you should be generating when can you find something that's almost right but not quite. And you just, you know, you found your purple frog and it's dancing, but you need to make it more disco like that probably wouldn't be hard to do. Um, the other problem, and that sort of leads to that earlier question is like, which embeddings do you really want to use and evaluating how well they're working? It can be, it can be hard to do because you've got to get a lot of queries, a lot of responses evaluate how they are, try to figure out which corners of the space just don't work well. And I have some examples of places where we know they don't work well. Um, a more engineering type concern is like, how many types of embeddings do you wanna have? Like it's worthwhile for Adobe Stock to have color embeddings because it is so used by some of, um, by, by some of the customers. They really need to have this. But do we, you know, and audio is very different. You can't, forcing audio into the same space as images is probably hard. So you probably need a separate set of embeddings for those. But this could start to proliferate and you, it may just get unruly to have that many types of things in your search index. So you really have to think about what are your, what are the cases you want to support? Um, 
And a topic that I will not get into a lot here, but we'll have time, so I'll talk about a little bit, is just latency. People expect search to be basically instant. Um, calculating cosine similarity scores for 400 million items, if you put in an image to search, currently not happening in the time frame that I, as a very impatient person when I'm searching, am going to tolerate. I mean, you don't have any idea how impatient you are until you have to work with a prototype system, which has not been optimized yet. And you're like, where is that thing? And it's only been two seconds, but two seconds is a long time in the search world. Um, we, re we really expect these to be fast. And fortunately, there are a set of people who have really been working on optimizing that. So there are techniques for that. That is probably not going to be your biggest problem, but figuring out where things work well and what embeddings, and then the best way to make them fast, that, that's sort of the key to the game right now. So, so what's the median time of response for these kind of queries? I mean, I'm just very curious about this. You mentioned that two, two seconds is already enough. I mean, usually how, how fast can it be with so many images? I mean, yeah, well, usually you're trying to cut the space down so you're not going to actually search through that many yeah. images. Yeah. Um, and we'll, I'll talk about a little bit about that before, but um, I, can, I can definitely tell you as a person, you get over a second and you really notice it. Mm -hmm. So you really, and, and you've got things that aren't even in the search part that, that add to slowness. Like you've got to render those images. Oh, yeah. um, and those are sort of, uh, that's a separate type of optimization. Um, if you're just using embeddings, there are a few other things um, that actually can cause problems, which is why I think using, as you probably can tell by the title, is using pure embedding-based search, um, especially for ranking the images, I don't think is always going to be the way to go. Um, so one of the biggest problems is what I call the Pictionary effect. So Pictionary, if you've never played it, is this game where Alex and I are on a team, I get a word, and I've got to draw a picture, and he's got to guess what the word is. So needless to say, I'm going to draw the most stereotypical thing possible for the word. So if I have cheese, and at least if we're playing in the US, I'm going to draw a wedge of Swiss cheese. If he still doesn't get it, I'm going to draw a little mouse next to it because that is the cartoon characteristic of what cheese is, even though no one in the US buys wedge, big wedges of Swiss cheese, and they certainly don't have a mouse sitting next to it. But it's this canonical image and so because of the way the embeddings work, there's one point that's sort of the perfect exact match for it. So an image to image search is probably exactly that image. And everything else moves very gradually away. So for this image of these three tulips on an isolated white background, image similarity search is giving you things that are very, very close. Maybe the tulips are slightly different color, or there's, you know, a slightly more blossoms. But if what you drop this image in for was you just wanted to see drawings of tulips, this doesn't give you an idea of the diversity of drawings of tulips that there are there. Mm -hmm. And so it could be perfect because maybe this was very close to what you wanted, but it could be that it's just, it's just too close. Um, and that we could force some diversification in if we thought you were in a scenario where you wanted to explore more. Um, embeddings generally, at least image ones, don't have much of an idea of quality. Um, and so they won't necessarily, one thing search algorithms have been very honed for is when they do that ranking step, they often use a, things about quality, like how many people clicked on that document before are purchased it if it's something you can purchase or if it's on an e-commerce site put star ratings on it um these popularity and quality signals are extremely valuable for helping you get really nice in this case maybe high quality images on top or the most reliable um 
documents. This is why you'll notice if you do searches off uh, that are sort of for factual entities, Wikipedia pages show really high on top. It's the reliability of Wikipedia and the popularity of using it mm -hmm. that make it rank so high, even for very simple one word queries. Um, and embeddings generally, they may have indirectly learned a little bit about quality, uh, but they know nothing about really about popularity. Mm -hmm. um, so that's something you sort of need to bring in separately in the ranking step. Uh, if you if instead of using, say, pure embedding based search. Um, and as we'll see, there's certain types of queries. Um, and by queries, I largely mean textual that really don't work well. Um, and let's let's see an example of this. Uh, so one of the when you're doing text to image, so quer textual queries to image. Things that look similar, but have a specific reference are a big problem for the model. So. If you have a query Bermuda coast and you were just doing one of these text to image models, you'd get this lovely set of things. I've never been to Bermuda, but to me, these, yeah, they all look like Bermuda coast. Great. Only about half of the images here are really in Bermuda. If you actually click and look at the titles, there'll be other similar islands. If I need an image and I was using Bermuda just to say, oh, you know, this type of, you know, nice blue ocean, sky, some sand, great. If I'm writing a tourist brochure and it has to actually be in Bermuda, this is a big problem because I'd have to click through a lot before I found which ones could I use and not be you know, in trouble for using some other really beautiful island uh, photo in my brochure. Um, so that's one class of problems that you can run into. Another is things that sort of distribute similarly, but have different meanings. So uh, any generally anything with numbers and model numbers are like this. So if you're running an e-commerce site and you get a lot of people looking for model numbers, uh, battery sizes, or if you're doing search over documents and there are lots of years, those things are much better as real just indexing the text. They're very exact things. They're very fast to look up. And generally the embedding text models and text to image models are just terrible with those. Mm -hmm. um, similar to that are people names, which often group sort of by gender and ethnicity. So you'll get like all the Greek names returning for one another and all the Russian names returning for one another, um, even if you're writing them all in uh, Latin characters. Uh, and for uh, the semanticists among you, so this one's for you, Alex, you know, negation and counterfactuals, the text models are getting better at that. Um, but this is a general problem for search. If you've gone and looked for, uh, say, clothing items and you're like, you know, dresses without stripes mm -hmm. and all it sees is dresses and stripes. And so you get a whole page of striped dresses. This is actually a much harder search problem than you would think, um, in part because the without and the not are often just dropped or they're matched to random keywords and descriptions. So this is not really a problem just with embeddings. This is a problem search has um, as a whole, but the embeddings aren't just solving it for us. Um, it may it'll be interesting to see whether as the language models improve, they actually help to at least get very common cases of this type. Yeah, well, it's a problem that comes from the from the old times, the kind of factors, et cetera. Yeah. The reference. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And you probably have noticed if you're ever searching for something, the top results are almost what you want, but they have one thing in them you don't want, and you put mm -hmm. not something. And unfortunately, often it doesn't help. Uh, it does sometimes, but not always. Mm. Okay. Um, so, you know, after this, this uh, do we have a question, Alex, before we yeah, go to the Mara next says, section? What are, uh, what are you mentioning with Bermuda Coast is a challenge journalists face when writing articles and need pictures that match the topic and also get metadata about uh, its authenticity. So she, she says that it's a, it's a challenge. Yeah, so in, yeah. 
Yeah, no, and that, that's actually an interesting question. Like for Adobe, for this stock type example, we're actually very lucky because in general, the metadata and the what the contributors have put on, mm -hmm. especially location names and things is correct. Um, this is why we keep the data from the auto taggers separate from the data provided by the contributors because we the auto taggers have exactly sort of the problem you're talking about. They also see this and it's like, oh, I've seen pictures of Bermuda Coast. A lot of them, these all look like Bermuda Coast. Maybe I should auto tag them. Mm. Um, and we need to know whether or not that's the type of thing we really want to auto tag. Um, finding things people have been per purposely deceptive on, that's a harder problem. I think it's a, it is a search problem maybe we can save that to, to sort of discuss some in the uh, the question period. But even with, you know, well-intended, really good data, mm -hmm. um, the embeddings will have this problem in general regardless. While at least if you've got what you believe is pretty good uh, metadata, the keyword search can help to, uh, to clarify that. At least maybe you could re-rank all the Bermuda ones on top above the ones that didn't mention Bermuda. Um, which is actually a good segue into like, what, how do these sort of, we've seen, there are definitely a lot of really good benefits here. There are some problems, you know, how can we uh, balance these out? Um, so per that very first picture, one of the things you can do um, to help th make things work better is customizing embeddings for your features, whether you're fine tuning a model or doing it from scratch. Um, and this can help you if you've got a, something that's just not quite bringing back exactly what you want. There's a class of things that don't work. Maybe your vocabulary is very specialized in some way. Um, so for this text to image, we actually have our a model that um, the, we have a research lab, the research lab trained for us. And we worked with them across what we needed it for. So because we needed, one of the reasons we had trouble with off the shelf models is they tend to work well on what I'd call longer text. And by longer, I mean like more than five words. So for the NLP people, this doesn't seem long, but a lot of search queries are one or two words. So we needed something that could work on really short things like the kids with sunglasses we saw in the, at the beginning. And with those longer, more descriptive ones, like the woman meditating uh, at golden hour. Um, we wanted something that worked on our stock images and also express templates. There are a few examples of uh, templates here. Um, and stock images generally are higher quality than the, you know, like photos that I take and that people use to train these models where they get a lot of these more blurry images, things like that. We only needed things to work with really high quality images. Uh, we needed five languages, so not just something that worked English on there. Um, and for latency, we needed the dense version, which is what we've been talking about for the embeddings, but also a sparser version that, and uh, I think we'll have time, so I'll go through later a slide, that lets you do these more like a compromise between embeddings and keywords that you can run very fast over a lot of images. Um, so to give you an idea of the types of queries we needed to be able to do uh, for express templates, here's some sample real uh, birthday queries. You get the obvious things like birthday, birthday card, birthday invitation. But you also get things like one birthday invitation kids unicorn. Something they want something for uh, you know, a, a kid's first birthday. Um, and if you use the this, these embeddings, you can get things like the examples you have down below or baseball ticket birthday invite. Like I can envision what they want for this. This probably doesn't exist in our corpus, but yeah, you want a birthday invitation for some kid to make it look like a little ticket to a, to a baseball game. It's something you could create, probably not something that's there. Perfectly reasonable query. Um, and definitely something that we probably don't have keywords exactly matching, but maybe we can find, a, you know, or this was, I guess was a basketball, a basketball, you know, birthday invitation, and then they could modify it for that. Um, 
And we had an advantage when we were doing that in that we already had a lot of queries. So we knew what these would look like. Uh, so we could give the queries to the research team to give them some feel for the type of text that we would be looking for. Uh, so and this was a case where customizing the embeddings made, it meant that we knew it would work well for our scenario. And we knew we were going to use it for multiple things. We were going to use it both in stock and express, probably for multiple different features. And that, that made it worthwhile to do. Because it was a lot of work for them and for us. We did a lot of evaluation as they iterated over the models. Um, the other thing we did is like there were things we did completely separate models for. Um, so we do the search for HelpX documentation, which comes in quite a few languages. As you can imagine, if you're searching through the help documentation, you probably don't know what things are called. Because if you did, you probably wouldn't be needing to call do help. Um, and often you need to describe the problem in something that's more than two words. Uh, and so this is perfect for a text embedding type of approach. Um, you know, so we used to be if people asked, when I click using the pen tool, nothing happens. Perfectly reasonable thing to ask. Before the results were these quite honestly, worse than useless suggestions to click elsewhere because you were in the right place. You were looking in the general help documentation. We just couldn't match the keywords. Um, by using embeddings, we were then able to actually find uh, different help documents that you could look through to find more information about you know, what might be wrong when we, you were using the, trying to use the pen tool and it didn't work. Um, one interesting thing of this that um, was that we discovered with very short queries, you were much better off, you know, if you just said crop, so cropping image is a very common thing to do. If you just had crop image or crop as a query, you're better off with the keyword search that has lots of behavioral data from people who'd clicked, read documents, found they were useful. Soon as you got even slightly longer, you wanted to use the embeddings. And so that was a really interesting finding about how we could have customized embeddings because the vocabulary for help is very different. And Adobe has quite a few products whose names overlap with general terms like Acrobat, Rush, Illustrator. So we you needed the vocabulary to be specialized. You know, so, so it was worthwhile doing a multilingual textual model to do these and really improve the search. Um, audio similarity for music, also something you probably need a dedicated model for. Uh, we have one that the research team did for us. And we talked a little bit about color for images. Um, so it's really sort of almost a feature by feature. It's not like you're like, oh, I'm running search for Adobe. Here's the one model I need. You need to think about exactly what you're searching over and what the features are you want to build. Okay. Um, now to talk a little bit about sort of the match set. So that's just the initial set of items you're bringing back, not even worrying about the ranking and speed. What, what do you really want? Our goal is we really want to be able to get this broad coverage capability from embedding. So having a really long query, big data set, find all the images we want, but we want to do it really fast and we want the results to be as accurate when, or as close to accurate as possible, so very relevant, even when we're doing it fast. The ways people have found to do this basically have to do with bucketizing the embedding. So instead of, and we'll have an example on, I think, the next slide, but basically those embeddings, you know, maybe you've got a thousand numbers with each image. If instead you can sort of group things together so that either each image only has a few numbers, but they're spread out over larger things, so it's more like keywords, or you pick, you group the images as similar ones and declare, here's the, think of it as the canonical image, you figure out which canonical images, which big clusters are good, and then you just search over those clusters. There's lots and lots of literature 
on this. I am definitely not the expert on this, um, but you, you have to do something. Even with bigger machines, there's just a limit when you're looking over millions of documents and calculating these similarity metrics as to how fast you can go. Um, so basically, another thing you can do, yeah. So basically, um, just just to make sure if I got it right, so it's basically some kind of uh, reduction, uh, dimensionality reduction method. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, we we do. We'll have time to go over an yeah. example. It's one nice thing about this longer talk segment is you'll actually we can actually walk through yeah. walk through the example, but it's exactly that type of thing. Um, you know, to to get the higher quality results, like for certain things, like those model numbers, you probably just want to use the keyword system, you know, to get the model numbers. For things like Bermuda, maybe you need to use a mix of the embeddings plus that. Um, one way you can sort of take advantage of embeddings, but still get a sort of take advantage of the system you may have already had is use the embeddings for null and low recovery. So like if you have maybe less than 100 results, you can show the results you got from your inverted index system, but also take a little bit longer and search using the embedding. Since after all, it might be worth waiting that second or two, you know, even for impatient people like me, if the other thing was you got nothing. Um, and so, say, and also when you got nothing, well, certainly it wasn't relevant. So if you have to do something that does more bucketizing the embedding, so they're not quite as relevant, it still may get you close and get you some idea of, oh, this is the space I want. Maybe if I add these keywords, it'll be smaller and get what I want, or I can use image similarity to find it. Um, and when using things like image search, image to image search, if you can if encourage people to also use one or two keywords, you can use those keywords on the inverted index, which cuts the space smaller. So maybe you're in a million images instead of hundreds of millions. And then it's much easier to do that calculation. So some of these are sort of helping the user formulate a query that will get them more accurate results more quickly. Um, but I think this idea, its there's going to be a lot of work in this space of when do you use which type approach in order to get this to work. And I think this is a very, we're just now really getting into the, the space where the technology is such that we can try lots of different things and figure out for each each thing you're building the search for, what's the most effective way? Where do you use the embeddings? Where do you use um, where do you use the keywords? Um, so to talk about the embeddings, and this will also give you just a better feel for what these embeddings look like. So what embeddings, the dense one that we've been talking about sort of look like are, you probably have a dimension of somewhere between 1,000 and 2,000. And maybe they're a little shorter. Every image has a number for each one of those buckets. So it's a very long embedding. And it's dense because it's called dense because you have a number for each one. Um, but you can do this sort of bucketizing or dimension reduction where each image you sort of only keep the most important buckets, uh, but you probably have many more dimensions. So in this case, you know, maybe you've got 8,000 dimensions, but each image maybe only has a, a few of these, somewhere say maybe, maybe between 10 and 100. Um, obviously, like with all search, your query has to be in the same type of embedding as what you're going to be searching over. So if you're using dense embeddings, your query's got to be dense if you're using these sparse ones, um, your query also has to be sparse. But if you look at the, the little thing here, you'll see if our query is this thing that I'm calling query equals image one here, it's only got a few dimensions filled. So it'll only match a few of the images. 
And it might not match all of them. I think I've got a little thing, but you can imagine if all we had was what you see on the screen there, um, and I can't actually see all of my edge here, but hopefully you'll be able to, you guys can see it. Like for query image one, image two here matches on one dimension. Um, image three on none of the dimensions and image four on two of them. And I, as the person creating the search system can decide how many dimensions do you have to match to be considered? Is it one? Is it two? I can decide for my feature how much I have to match. It's certainly not zero. So I've already thrown out a lot of things. So this is very fast because basically, although these dimensions don't mean anything, unlike words, which really do mean something, they are effectively like keywords and that they're very easy to just look up. You're just looking up the match. Um, it just happens to be it's got a sort of confidence score type of thing. So when you're, you can use those scores to help on the ranking by taking, um, you know, the fact, the score, say, of the bucket in the query and multiplying it by the score in the bucket of the image you matched. And if you match more things, you get more numbers that you could have multiplied and added up. So you, it's not as accurate as having a full cosine similarity score but it is still a score you can use in your ranking, maybe combined with other features that you want to use. Um, and so that's basically how you can, you can reduce these, one of the ways that you can reduce these in order to be able to very quickly get your set of results and maybe some initial ranking. Once you have an initial ranking, you can do what's called a second round ranker and just take, say, the top thousand results and do whatever you want with them. You could easily then calculate the dense um, embed embedding score for a thousand images and get them very accurate, but you're only working over a very small number. Um, and even in before embedding based search, most of the real big search engines you're working with, they've got multiple rounds of rankers on them. You know, first you find your documents, you get a big set, you do something really fast, you get a smaller set, then you do something really fancy to try to get you those really nice results on top. And in fact, this is talks a little bit about how you might want to do a hybrid ranking with embeddings, which um, we found to be an extremely useful way to leverage embeddings. Um, and what we really want to do is leverage the strengths of things like past user behavioral signals, which in this case, these are these express templates, a bunch of infographics here. Um, you know, which ones have people used a lot, which is sort of an indication they like them. Which have people used a lot in the last month? Maybe all of a sudden it's, you know, people like a different style of thing. It's sort of hard to know what styles of things people like, but you can see what they use now before versus before. So you can get popularity, quality, trending type signals. But you can use the embedding to get sort of this core relevance or semantic type of meaning out of them. Um, um, and so there, then you can sort of leverage both these types of signals. Um, there are a couple different ways you can do this. We're not going to go into these in detail. Um, the simplest one is probably to just do multiple rounds. You first do whatever ranker you were doing before, basically, um, before you had the embeddings. And then you just take the top few, 100,000, something in that range, and, re -score, and just rescore those based on your embedding score. Very simple thing to do. Um, the other thing you can do is just use the embedding relevance score within your traditional machine learned ranker. Uh, to do this, you have to have few enough results that you can actually calculate um, the embedding score in order to do this. So you probably need to do this as a second round ranker, but instead of just using the embedding score, you're using all the scores together, which often gives you better diversity and higher quality results at the top. Um, what works best for you will depend a lot on what exactly the feature is you're doing. 
Um, for example, these express templates, we have a lot of them, but we're not talking millions. While for the stock images, we're talking hundreds of millions. And what to do with those varies a lot. So for example, if you have one of those specific queries like the unicorn birthday one, there's probably only a few exact match templates in there. You can't lose those, except for maybe the purple disco frog. If you're looking for anything more common in stock, there's going to be a lot of matches. And so we want to get good, you know, relevant matches on top. But if we're a little bit off, you still have good exact matches at top. Um, and so we have a little more leeway of the number of different things we can try just because of the way the result sets are. Um, and also, as we get longer and longer queries, I think the types of things we need to try are going to be really different. Um, but the nice thing is right now, we now have many more techniques for how to handle these. And so the fun part is figuring out, OK, what can what what can we what will really work well? And it's a very, it's an unsolved but very practical problem, which I think is a, a really good space to be in. Um, so some takeaways and then we can do question period. You know, we basically embeddings are a new hammer. They're a really, really big new hammer. And we've got to figure out which nails we're going to hit with this. Um, multimodal, especially image text embeddings, clearly a place where we we this opens up fields that we just couldn't do before. Um, and the text embeddings, particularly good for things like those help documents where the queries you get just really use different terminology and tend to be very long compared to the documents you have. Um, and I'd like to end on the fact that search is really, it is not dead. Obviously, we need it for a specific photos. So Dasha gets to shine here at the end of the uh, uh, of our talk. You want it for e-commerce. You know, you, you want to find a specific thing you want to buy. You might be getting more answer-like things to help you understand what that those items are you're looking at. But you need to find real things. And you as the merchant want people to be able to find your things. Uh, legal documents, uh, trust me, when you get a query for at least from the US tax authority, they want a real tax document. So you got to find your where your tax documents are. Um, all those answering questions, like our very first Excel, how do I put in the carriage return thing? Those answers need to be correct. And the way to get them to be correct is to find an underlying accurate document and then create the answer from it. Um, especially as these large language models, they were created at a point in time for uh, the types of questions and facts that evolve, you know, who's the head of state of a given country. That's the type of thing you can search for it, but then produce a really nice answer like thing to put at the top of search or in, in some other feature. Um, and when you do that, if you have a link to the document, everybody can then verify it or get more details if they want more details without having to run another search. You can just put like a little link to learn more. Um, and another, and as part of the answers, but even for image type things, I think being able to use search, you can get high quality input for subsequent generation and modification. So if I do want to create that purple uh, disco frog, I could try generating from scratch, but if I can find something that looks sort of like what I want and use that as a reference image in image generation, I can probably get exactly what I want much more quickly. Um, and so I think that's the type of thing that we'll find very subtle uses of search for combined inside of features that you don't even think is search. And so with that, thank you very much and happy to take questions. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Tracy, uh, for this very interesting and thought-provoking talk. Um, so some questions have already come to mind, but let's hear our audience's questions and comments first. So please raise your hand to speak. Um, uh, if you have uh, any questions or comments to make. I'll just go back to the previous slide so that yeah. in case that inspires questions. 
sí. Well, I could probably start with my questions and maybe yeah. people uh, will follow up with their own. Um, so, I mean, I, I think I found your point on, on the slides, uh, especially the slides, the last slide about the key takeaways, very inspiring. Mm -hmm. So, look, I mean, since using is embeddings right now exclusively is practically the way to go, that's, what, that's how I feel. And we don't usually question their usage or value in each use case, but you made this valid point that it's just a hammer that you have mm -hmm. to know where to, to use them. And uh, the question is about the multimodal search is mm -hmm. uh, related to the fact that when you create a unified embedding space, um, so that you have data from different modalities, that must mm -hmm. be challenging, right? Um, and I mean, I was wondering how effective are these techniques for creating these spaces? I mean, uh, are they evaluated in any way how effective they are i mean is there because uh it's a very interesting problem to see data coming from different modalities and suddenly being represented yeah. in a common space so it was just uh... yeah and i will say maybe it, it it's sort of interesting because evaluating search it's in some sense a must studied field but it's very hard to fully automate mm -hmm. um so when we were working with the team, like doing that one we're using there, we did a combination of things just to be able to iterate quickly. So because we have past anonymized user logs, we see things like clicks for kids with sunglasses. I have no idea how many times we've seen that query, but it's a lot. Mm -hmm. And we so we know that multiple people have clicked on the following, say, Mm -hmm. 25 images for this. So you know those images are good and you can run queries like kids with sunglasses with your just with the embeddings, mm -hmm. only the embeddings and see how high up on the page are the images that were clicked on. Now, what you don't know is were the other images not clicked on because they were not kids with sunglasses mm -hmm. because they were kids with sunglasses, but the photo wasn't any good or somebody just really wanted that one. So it's not a it does it's not perfect for telling you about relevance, but it helps you iterate quickly. Mm -hmm. And then once you get a model that you know maybe you've plateaued, you say okay, okay, this is as good as we're going to get, then we actually manually go through and do evaluation and and for different types of queries try to see, oh, you know, maybe this isn't good for queries with people in it. Or it's not doing well on, it's good on photos, but not illustrations. Mm -hmm. And so you can sort of either say, okay, we're going to have to do something different for those, mm -hmm. or we need to change the training data and put in more illustrations or something like that. Um, but it's part of the reason I actually like having other um, components in as well, because then you can adjust if the search results don't seem right to you, you can adjust the, try to adjust them by blending in more on the keyword rank in the, in the ranking part, or you can use the embeddings just for the ranking and not for the recall. Like you, you can go back and forth on them. Um, I do find the hardest thing to predict is if there's stuff that matches, it's generally good, but it's like, what happens once you've run out of things you match? Mm -hmm. And I, that's where it breaks down of like, what's the intuition of that, that map of France with all the, the, you know, cheeses and things on it. Like what happens when you hit the river Valley? Like sometimes something really weird goes on or you hit the ocean. And I feel like it's that type of thing. You just, you can't, I can't think, even think of it. I can't introspect the machine very well. Mm -hmm. um, you do see research papers on trying to understand the spaces better. Uh, so it'll be really interesting to see if if people get a good feel for that, especially for what's what's really not understood. Like what would happen if somebody uploaded something completely different that we hadn't thought of before? Um, mm -hmm. Fortunately, all the AI generated images, of which there are quite a few 
do people uh, do AI generation and then they do really beautiful um, touch up jobs and alterations on them. So they look like really high quality illustrations. Um, those worked really well with the model we had trained, even though it wasn't trained on them. Uh, but you could imagine there could be something like that where all of a sudden there's just a difference in your your documents to use document in the broad word. Um, and it just went bad. And you have, so you have to keep an eye on search systems in general, because that's also a problem with the old inverted indices. Um, if there's some new type of thing that comes on in the language, you may not be able to match it well. Mm, I see, I see. Thanks. Um, uh, but yeah, yeah I, I agree. It's really hard to think about these, um, but it looks like, do we have a question? I noticed someone popped on with their video. Yeah, I think it's Mara. Oh. Hello, thank you Hello. for your talk. It's been great, very interesting. Uh, I was wondering, based on your last comments, um, is slang language a challenge for search, especially to combine uh, text with uh, image? Um, it. I think this is a, so yes, all types of, I mean, both slang, but even just different ways of calling things are a classic problem with search. So I worked uh, in e-commerce search for a while and there's like what, the merchants try really hard for people to buy their stuff because that's their business. So they'll do the best they can to label things. But in the, us as users, we're non-experts in what they're doing and we may call things different ways. So a simple one in English is like wedding dress and bridal gown. They mean exactly the same thing. Bridal gown's a little fancier sounding, but they're really the same phrase. They mean the exact same thing. And if you don't know about this when you're building your search engine, you're like someone types in bridal gown and you'd think we had nothing because everybody's called it a wedding dress because it's the more common term. Um, the embeddings are actually better for that um, because in general, you've put enough text in to find it. But if the slang changes, and the term comes into use sort of after you've done your embeddings. Yeah, you can, it, it's, then you have a real problem, especially if you don't have a backup keyword search where maybe people are starting to put it on the keyword side. Um, so it is a problem. Uh, the other thing that's really can be difficult is of course you have to handle multiple languages and you have to do this with keyword search too, but you have to, to, to Alex's question about sort of the evaluation, understanding whether your non-English models are as good as your English one is something you really have to work on because usually all these models, it's much easier to get hold of English data. Um, and so the English works better than the others and the question is you know can we can we get over that and when it makes mistakes can you understand like say maybe you have a you people build these multilingual text embeddings which can be very good in aggregate but sometimes they make weird mistakes and usually it's from some funny false friend term or thing or to your point about the slang and, you, and you'd feel like you don't, as a search person, you don't have as much control about it because the, with the keywords, you can debug what went wrong. Embeddings make it much harder to debug what went wrong. Um, but I think we will need a way, just like you have to involve evolve the facts in these large language models, perhaps by just looking up documents and generating from them. We do have to evolve the language and uh, maybe I don't remember if it was you or someone else who asked that question about the like fine tuning and changing the model. But if, if you fine tune it, at least then you can fine tune periodically um, with new data to update to new usage of language. But if you were doing something, say, over social media, you would you that has a lot of, let's just say, unusual language evolving slang what do you do with you know if you have hashtags what do you do with those because they contain interesting information 
but they're definitely a different type of language. But yeah. Thanks. So it, it embeddings have not solved that, but they, if it's stuff you saw in the training data, I think they actually help a little bit on the text side to have the embedding and not just the keywords. Thanks. Thank you. Um, Thank you. So in the same spirit, I would say also that the same the same comment or the same response you have for these uh, compound nouns, right? Like with non-compositional compound nouns, so then okay. you have the same uh, kind of response, I, I, I guess, right? I assume. Yes, yeah. So if you think of I mean, like um like the the classic example we use a lot in English is hot dog, which yeah. okay, they are war served warm, but basically they're sausages. They have yeah. nothing to do with dogs. Um yeah. And if you're not careful with your keyword search, you break it up and sure you get the hot dogs, but you also get all types of other uh, crazy things. And that is something that in general, especially for these super common things and most non-compositional ones have to be common by definition or no one would remember them. Mm -hmm. um, the language models are pretty good with mm -hmm. them. Um, you know, and and so you don't have to make these decisions of, oh, should I actually index hot dog as if it's one word, just a word with a space in it um, that that the model can can sort of take care of that for you. But it does mean it has to be common enough that it's seen it. And for multimodal, you have to, you know, have seen enough little, you know, hot dog images or sort, of, sort of to know that, yeah, this sausage here might be a hot dog. <laughs> Okay, thanks. But yeah, and that that I would put in this range of this. That's one of these sort of nice classic search problems, mm -hmm. um, you know. And it's not like hot dog isn't used also in the literal sense, um, mm -hmm. as well. You might want images of you know dogs on you know hot dogs, you know drinking water, playing the fountain, things like that. Mm -hmm. uh, but the default meaning is definitely the sausage. Mm -hmm. And and I mean I guess the same problem I mean not problem but uh, the response would be for neologisms uh, I mean some, which is a different kind of subject than that since it's a classical kind of problem then this problem still remains to be there right it's just it's not like something really changes with these embeddings right yeah 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 I mean I think that the thing that has the classic problem that has changed a lot is the one like is where you've got these longer, more descriptive queries. Mm -hmm. And so if you do have things in and you have a text image model, that's the one where it's like, yeah, now we can actually find those that the woman meditating at dawn type of one. Like that's the kind of thing that has it gone away, not completely but it is much better than in the keyword world where you had to sort of say, okay, let's, if we don't find anything with all the keywords, we'll do some keywords and we'll have to figure out what's our minimum and how do we weight them relative to one another. Mm. That That is less there because you have more of a chance of the text image model surfacing if you had something that matched something good on top. So that, that would be like the, the really big one and, the, and that sort of text to text, like in the help domain that's gotten, it's, is it solved? No, but it is much better than it used to be, mm. you know? And I do like, I mean, although obviously for the image search that we don't use this much, but for when you can actually provide better, when you're working the text domain, answers and better captions and things then with a way to people to drill down and learn more i think anything that makes it so you have a better idea when you're on the search page or in your little help you know panel yeah this is this is likely an accurate answer to what you were looking for and maybe you don't even need to click because it's like the excel one it's like oh yeah i should have remembered that i did that you know, twice a year I do this and I have forgotten. Looks right. Bam. There it is. And if it's wrong, 
it's not like I've destroyed anything. I just have to go click and re see what I missed in the answer. But I think there's a lot of potential there for improving the experiences, um, but you largely still need to have search underneath them. But it, it could really make a lot of difference, especially on like small mobile phones um, or if you need to, you know, especially for accessibility type things, if you're um, not actually reading it, but it's being read aloud to you, if you can get the answer right there and not have to go through a lot of text, makes a big difference. But it has to be accurate. Mm, great. So I guess uh, search is not dead at all, and it's uh, underneath uh, many uh, parts of a system. And I was just NLP system, and I was just wondering these new nowadays these new rag type of uh, mm -hmm. techniques. Uh, they can could they? I mean, the question is, could they integrate this uh, hybrid kind of? Uh, uh, model that you described today, uh, does this fit within this uh, commonly used technique, this uh, retrieval augmented generation uh, type of systems? Um, is uh, it simply a matter of plug and chug or is it is it something more complicated uh, in fitting them together somehow? I, I guess a certain yeah. component is there, right, in these RAG systems that are very... Um, yeah, yeah, no. And we've been working with the research team some on RAG systems to further improve like the the health mm -hmm. uh, a type of thing. Um, and I think you're right. It's the re all of the stuff we've talked about for the the better the retrieval part of so these retrieval augmented generation, you want to generate something might mm -hmm. be an answer to a question might just, you know, might might be a, even an image, but you want to generate some type of thing. And the way you're going to generate it is first you find, you retrieve a whole bunch of, or at least one relevant document, and then you could almost view it as summarization um, and, and maybe a little expansion. The better that document or small set of documents are, the better your generation will be. Um, and so I think you know, sometimes people are running keyword search below these, sometimes pure semantic search. But I think, you know, depending on the use case, certainly for the help type use case, a combination of these is going to be be really helpful. Um, because one thing that's really interesting is that, so search generally, well, originally people typed in really long queries because they had no idea how keyword search worked and you did. I want to find out a document about blah, blah, blah. And then you soon realize the results were horrible and you just were like, Excel short shortcuts, bam, you know. So we were tra trained for years to do these shorter queries um, and the search engines were then optimized for short queries. And now, and I think as an NLP person, this is fantastic. You know, people can now type in at least slightly longer queries, five, you five word queries and things. Um, and get results. So the expectation is you can do that. But what's interesting is um, for image generation, you, you know, these are, I won't say classically because these things haven't existed that long, but they generally work well with really nice, long descriptive uh, prompts. You know, you want, you want to get that frog at the disco, that short, like five word thing I had, usually you'd want something more, a little more descriptive. Mm -hmm. But you will see people inputting what look like search queries. They'll mm -hmm. just be like kids with sunglasses. Okay, three words, but maybe it's just like sunglasses. To generate something nice from that, either you just tell people, sorry, add more, or you could expand under the hood to have longer prompts. Or you could search for some a few results to help diversify the generation that you're going to have for it and get a better feel for when people want kids with sunglasses, wow. what type of image space are we really in? Mm -hmm. um, but it's sort of interesting that as the qu queries get longer, but this when you're prompting for image generation, people are sometimes treating these as if it's a search problem. Um, and using these short queries and not necessarily getting really satisfying results for them. Um, so I just find it a very interesting way that these generation and search worlds and way we as people interact with them 
they're sort of the same. Uh, I mean, technically you think of them, oh, you know, I work on image generation, I work on prompts, or I work on search and I work on queries, but that world is blurring. And I don't think people draw always a strict, a strict line. I mean, when I want the picture of my cat, that's a strict line. You know, it's like, no, don't go generating cats looking at puzzles. You know, this is my, and just my camera roll only, find the cat. You know, and maybe someone did some nice image touch up because the lighting is probably overexposed in this one. But, you know, uh, but other than that, the lines are sometimes really blurry as to whether it's generated. And I think you're right. The rag play is, is one of those places. And the better the retrieval is, the better the, our generation is going to be. Um, yeah, and the retrieval is not solved. So there's still work on that side of it. Thank you very much. Um, any other questions? Uh, Mara, would you like to, to say something else? Or? Well, I think I'm good. And um, while uh, the whole discussion is ongoing, I was thinking that a lot of the things you're saying match a lot how we search into documents right now, especially mm -hmm. with uh, the generative AI coming. Yeah. Um, and um, because we're thinking of uh, such a project, uh, like analyzing semantically um, uh, manuals of products and mm -hmm. how you could, you know, ask a question which is similar to what you're describing as uh, mm -hmm. queries for search. And find the right spot in mm -hmm. one document or if it needs to go through many different documents to identify where the right answer is. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So it's not well, just I, um, just the web. It's It has many applications. That's right. Yeah, now that's actually a really, uh, something I didn't talk about here, but I think it does qualify as one of the definitely unsolved search problems, which is, yeah, you've got this collection of documents and you need to pull to answer your question, whatever it might be, you need to pull out a multiple documents and you may or may not know that you need to pull out a multiple documents. And I think there are a lot of, it's sort of like you need to do a research paper, uh, you know, might actually be a little smaller than that, but it's, it's as if you're doing a research paper and of course you're going to read a whole bunch of different things and synthesize them, but you want the machine to, to do it well. Um, yeah, no, I think that's a very interesting search space. Um, just even understanding what's in collections if you're new to the collection. Every time we get a new hire and we have all these wiki pages, and it's like, and they're of course completely, they're, they are, at one time they were organized, but you know, they get, disorganized over time. I do think there would be a very interesting search problem in just like, and this might be more generation, but could you find the themes and present them and then help people search through them and explore more? And it's definitely between this generation, summarization and search type of problem. Yeah, I think it's a good time for that type of research project. So. Uh, yeah, definitely be looking forward to seeing uh, seeing what worked well and what did not. Yeah. Uh, Mara is uh, the founding member of a small company uh, called Sandy Geek. And uh, I happen to have this the pleasure to know her from uh, our cooperation these uh, days. Oh, excellent. Yeah. Um, so I don't know if there are any other questions. Uh, guess it's about time for us to close today. Thank you very much, Trace, for your insightful and valuable lecture. And we are grateful for the time and effort you put uh, into sharing your knowledge with us today. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you for having me. It's been, it's been really fun. Uh, let's keep Thank it. you so much. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.